it just it just flies in the face of his competitiveness for one thing I mean I I can't imagine why uh, it, it's it's not the same person you know that, that I knew for a man to be just the opposite of what he's been made that's not right any attempt to make him a segregationist was was just ridiculous coach Ruck would play the devil he would dance with the devil for Mano W that's what he was all about winning and his players went to class that was the bottom line how you got there I don't think it mattered the W is what mattered he was a powerful figure and that's who you blame in many cases you blame the most powerful figure he was uh, noted throughout the Southeastern Conference in the United States as a great basketball coach but here's a program that didn't have black basketball player, so it's easy to make him the villain. A lot of people talk about him being a racist, and I totally disagree with that. I, I never, in all the years that I knew him, ever heard him say a derogatory word about any minority, ever. And, and I was around him a lot, a whole lot. I was around him before I went there, I was around him a lot while I was there, and I was around him a lot after I left. Uh, and I never, ever heard him say anything bad. You know, I think that there was a, there was a uh, jump to conclusion uh, on Coach Rupp, uh, that because of his demeanor, because of his gruff way, gruff approach, uh, that it, it, it just simply uh, it simply uh, fell to the to the notion that he was a, a, a racially prejudiced, and uh, none of us saw that. There wasn't a racist uh, bone in his body, and I think it. Anyone who knows me. Uh, Dick and knows how I feel about things. Uh, I wouldn't have worked for him if he were a racist. <laughs> it's that simple. I keep waiting for someone to show me where Adolf Rupp once acted on the reason of race. Once. Show me. You don't tell me what he said or may have said to somebody third or fourth hand. Show me where he once acted on race. He gave me a, a saying during that time, right is right and wrong is wrong. People are, that are judging him are not being, uh, some of them weren't even around, weren't even born to begin with, and then here they are writing all these editorials and what, just what they've picked up over, heard through the years. And what happens, and I'm old enough now to see this, is that once something like that takes hold, then it becomes accept, accepted as gospel, then it's repeated until finally it does become fact in a lot of people's minds. Adolf is, is, uh, is, is totally, I think, misrepresented, you know, in this whole concept when it comes to uh, him being a racist. He was not. I, I played for him. I know him. You know, he may have been a lot of things, Dick. Uh, he, he may have uh, some people said he was had a big ego, some said he was a tyrant, some said he was motivated by fear and all that kind of business. And, and I don't know, but the one thing I am dead sure of is that he was not a racist. Like so many college coaches, Adolph Rupp's career began on the high school level. In 1926, his Freeport, Illinois team included a black player. There were only six um, black youngsters in Freeport High School. He did not have to put this young man on the team for any political reasons. He put him on there because he was a basketball player and, and my father loved to win and this young man was a basketball player. And I came back and asked him, Coach, you had a black kid. So, I said, why? He said he could play. That, that was that simple. In 1930, Rupp took the job at Kentucky, although he wasn't sure it was a move he wanted to make until he got some advice from a friend. He was up on a ladder hanging a sign and he got down off the ladder and he says, Adolph, he says, I'll tell you one thing. You take that job. He said, you can always go to a better job from there than you can from here. You'll never get another chance to coach another university. And while you've got the chance, you'd better take it. Eighteen years later, he won the first of his four NCAA titles in 1948. That was the same year Rupp assisted in the selection process for the U.S. Olympic basketball team. Tryouts were held in Memorial Coliseum, and among the players Rupp chose, Don Barksdale. This youngster graduates from UCLA, is not allowed to play pro ball because the NBA is not integrated, 
So he's playing AAU ball, and yet through the tryouts, my father selects him as the first black youngster to participate in basketball in the Olympics for the United States. I had not seen a lot of black players play uh, other than the Gold Trotters at that time. And to, to, to see him uh, was a real opener for me. He was a great player. And I can remember Coach Rupp during those trials uh, calling attention to other players, his own, Wa Jones and others who were involved in this. That You know, look at his footwork. Watch how he does this. Watch how he does that. Um, so Coach Rupp had a great appreciation for for his skills uh, as a player. In 1950, Kentucky high schools were still segregated. Black schools held their own state tournament, which Rupp attended. We had two uh, state tournaments, uh, black and white, so he attended a session of the black tournament. He noticed a young player named Jim Tucker, who grew up in nearby Paris, Kentucky, following Rupp and the Wildcats. Growing up in Kentucky, University was the only basketball team in the country. Uh, I think that uh, everyone, every time the University of Kentucky played, black or white, the radio was on. We didn't have television back in those days, but my mother would tune in to uh, UK basketball, and the blue and white is what we grew up with. After Tucker's Paris Western team was eliminated, Rupp asked for and received permission to speak with him. I knew who he was, and uh, he said to me, I'd like to... Um, I like, I'd like for you to come to Kentucky, but you know our situation here. And, uh, but what I'd like to do is contact some of my friends in the coaching community and see if uh, they might have an interest in you because I think you have the uh, ability to become an All-American and a good basketball player. One of the teams Rupp contacted was Duquesne. Tucker eventually was accepted to and signed with the Pittsburgh School. His coach, Donald Moore, had never seen him play but trusted in Rupp's recommendation. He said that if Adolph Rupp recommends you, that's the only reason we showed the interest, because if he couldn't have you, then we'd like to. Tucker eventually did play for Rupp in a two-game All-Star series. I had a lot of respect for him. I had a lot of respect for his basketball team. I respect his position. <clears throat> not fully real, realizing, you know, what was going on behind the scenes. And uh, I believe that had he had the opportunity and the support of the school at that time, he would have had uh, black players. Tucker went on to become an All-American at Duquesne, which, ironically enough, in 1953 bumped Kentucky from the top spot in the Associated Press college basketball poll. Duquesne wasn't the only college signing black players, but the major schools that did were predominantly northern. Rupp, who knew talent when he saw it, began to consider taking what, for the basketball institution in the Southeastern Conference, would be a powerful and dramatic step. In 1960, he contacted a Cincinnati high school coach, who was also a U.K. scout, and asked him to appraise two immensely talented future Hall of Famers. He asked me a question who did I think was better, Oscar Robertson or Jerry West? And I immediately said Oscar Robertson, and he got a big grin on his face. And he said, would you be interested in, in coming to Lexington and helping us? Because uh, uh, we're going to be recruiting black youngsters. And it's only correct, and I want somebody who feels comfortable in their homes. In 1958, Kentucky would win its fourth national championship under Rupp with an overachieving team known as the Fiddlin' Five. But by the early 60s, the basketball Wildcats couldn't live up to the standards they'd set. From 1959 through 64, they won just one outright SEC championship and shared another. The University of Kentucky campus had been desegregated for several years, but still there were no black student-athletes allowed in the conference. SEC institutions adhered to a gentleman's agreement, no recruitment of African Americans. The sports media were silent. They, too, were a product of their time. You know, I'm 30 years older now. Certainly now I'm a different person than I was 30 years ago. You know, I'm much more in tune with that than, than then. Then all I cared about was finding the ballpark, watching the game, and writing a story about it. You know, I had very few issues that, that had anything to do outside the arena. 
UK President Dr. Frank Dickey sought to change that. We were able to break down the barriers for the students to attend the University of Kentucky. We were the first institution in the South to permit students to, Afro-American students to come. And we should be among the first when athletics was concerned. In 1957, he polled the SEC institutions about the possibility of recruiting black athletes. And in 1961, while he was taking his turn as president of the conference, he approached his athletics director, Bernie Shively, football coach Charlie Bradshaw, and Rupp, and told them he was going to ask the league to formally approve a move to desegregate its athletic teams. He wanted their blessing, and he got it. Rupp's one statement, though, was he said, I do not want we to, to be pushed too fast in this because I need to have the first player or first few recruits that we get to be successful in order that they will not uh, harm the efforts toward integration and that they will not harm themselves. And he said, to do this, he said, I think we have to look for a person who is a good team player and a person who is able to maintain his academic standing and retain his eligibility. The motion Dickey set before the SEC was resoundingly rejected. I think there was only one school at that time that said, yes, we will go along with you on this. The other said, we, if you do move in that direction, we're going to have to drop you from our schedule because we cannot guarantee that when you come to our home court, you will be safe or that you would be given any sort of welcome. And they said, obviously, the uh, Afro-Americans on their squad would have to sleep and eat someplace else and said, we don't think that's good, and we didn't either. Black leaders in Lexington who'd seen the proliferation of African-American athletes at Northern institutions took note of the fact that UK chose to maintain its membership in the all-white SEC. There were things that I think that, um, that the University of Kentucky did not do that they could have done that could have clearly, you know, uh, staked out a position in terms of where, you know, the university stood on this very moral issue. And, you know, we just did not take the moral leadership that we should have. Um, in terms of, you know, sort of setting a standard, you know, for the SEC. You know, for example, we stayed in the league. You see what I'm saying? Um, that's when you really demonstrate that you're, you're, you're firmly standing on your position. He was willing to tell the SEC, along with Dr. Dickey, back in the late 50s, he was going to leave the SEC. It was a move Rupp privately considered. We, we, we had no problem. He always said, we don't need it. Football may need it, but he didn't think football needed it either. Coach Rupp would have had to probably leave the Southeastern Conference had he integrated in the early days of, of integration. Uh, I mean, you got to remember what was happening throughout the South at that time. Uh, Mississippi State not being able to play in an NCAA championship and then having to sneak out because they were going to have to play against a black player. Um, other things happening in the Deep South, uh, Alabama, for example, uh, 63, uh, the Governor Wallace stands in the schoolhouse door to keep blacks from entering the university. Uh, now, how are you going to take, at, at the University of Kentucky, how are you going to take a black player into Tuscaloosa to play? Dickey said he considered the move, but with the school having just built a new basketball facility, playing a schedule minus traditional SEC opponents was a financial risk they couldn't afford to take. The attendance would have dwindled and uh, the ability to pay off the bonds which was a another moral obligation of the university uh, would have been in jeopardy and so the when I brought this to both the athletic board and to the board of trustees they said this has to be considered and it has to come first to be able to meet the obligations of the university to the bondholders in the end, Rupp acquiesced to the wishes of his superior. Asked about it at the end of his career, he was defensive. Oh, I've had the people tell me, uh, you're a big man. I was surprised at you. I was disappointed in you. Why didn't you drop out of the conference? 
Well, now, Adolf Rupp doesn't drop out of the conference. I don't determine the policies of the University of Kentucky, and I never 